no atheists on D-Day, I can assure you. The France and Germany Star is one of the nine campaign medals issued by the Commonwealth government during World War II. Similar to the campaign star of World War I, these medals are actually stars, each one representing a theater of action during the war. The campaign stars include the 1939-45 star, the Atlantic star, the Air Crew Europe star, the Arctic star, the Africa star, the Pacific star, the Burma star, the Italy star, and the France and Germany star. The France and Germany star was awarded for operational service in France, Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and Germany from D-Day, June 6, 1944 until May 8, 1945. The qualifying sea area is the southern part of the North Sea, the English Channel, and in the Bay of Biscay, provided such service was in direct support of land operations in Europe. As with all the World War II stars, the France and Germany star is a six-pointed star of yellow copper zinc alloy with a height of 44 millimeters and a maximum width of 38 millimeters. In the center of the obverse is the royal cipher of King George VI surmounted by a crown. The circlet surrounding the cipher reads the France and Germany star. The reverse is plain and there is no name or serial number of the recipient for Canada or Britain on the medal, although Australian and South African personnel did have this done. The France and Germany star has a single clasp for the ribbon, the Atlantic star. Should one be awarded the France and Germany star, then further qualify for the Atlantic star afterward, the clasp would be issued for the Atlantic star to be worn on the France and Germany star. Due to limitations on the number of stars that could be worn, the clasps are common throughout most of the World War II stars. On the other hand, should a recipient already have the Atlantic star or the Air Crew Europe star, and then qualify for the France and Germany star, they would receive a clasp for their current star with the France and Germany to be worn on that ribbon. As the Air Crew Europe star was no longer issued after D-Day, there is no corresponding clasp for it on the France and Germany star. A silver rosette was worn on the undress ribbon to denote the awarding of the Atlantic star clasp. The colors of the ribbon, which is a standard 32 millimeters in width, were rumored to be designed by King George VI himself with equal width stripes of blue, white, and red symbolizing the colors of the flags of Britain, France, and the Netherlands. Well, D-Day came and we landed on the beach. The 7th and 8th Brigade were used as assault brigades. The 9th Brigade, in which the North Nova Scotia Hunters were a part of, were assigned to uh, a, a backup of that day. And our job was to wait for two hours until the beach was cleared, and then we would go through them to attack a target at Carpique Airfield. And we arrived at Benny Samur in the afternoon. And on D-Day, strangely enough, the North Nova Scotia Highlanders lost four people dead. However, that night, uh, I was further assigned to take the first prisoners to the beach. And uh, I actually uh, had been pretty well worn down and so I, after I got them delivered, I fell asleep on the beach and woke up a little later on and I had to walk back to where the unit was approximately five, six miles uh, on an open road and you could walk from the beach all the way back to uh, where the unit was located and there was not a sound of any kind except the odd uh, weapon being fired, but nothing of a serious nature. And it was rather scary. But I got back the next morning in the middle of shelling. And uh, that day we moved on. And the tanks that were brought ashore that day 
where the Sherbrooke Fusiliers on our front, along with the Hussars of the London area, and they were a part of the brigade of uh, armor. And so they fought a battle against two Panzer divisions that were in the area by chance. And uh, we, intelligence hadn't picked them up and we didn't know what they were or what they w were going to be like. And as a result, a fantastic tank battle ensued and the Sherbrooke Fusiliers uh, lost 40 tanks in that battle to an equal number of a highly superior tank, a German Tiger tank. And uh, as the Germans actually lost 40 tanks and they also lost the battle to hold the line against the Allied forces. By that time, the British and the Americans that were on our left and right had established beachheads. And so now we, as a, as a battle unit, uh, are in a position to continue with the attack. Now the Americans are taking the brunt of the attack, but we're suffering equally because of the assigned areas. And with on the second, third, fourth day, we lost in our unit alone over half either killed or wounded. And it, half of a unit would be approximately 300 people. But we stayed at a place called Ebison for approximately three weeks. And I say we. I had been wounded on the night of the 10th. And I had been hit through the shoulder. And I left the next morning. And I was gone for two weeks. And when I arrived back, we were just getting ready for our major attack on Khan. So as a result of all this, I was back just in time for that, and a couple of real serious battles ensued after that, and uh, we eventually arrived at a place called Tilly, Tilly the campaign. And so the idea was Montgomery and his wisdom decided that he was going to attack this area uh, at night using searchlights to reflect on a low sky and uh, as a result we were chosen as a battalion to do this job. Well when we arrived at the scene the Germans were well dug in, they had been there for a long time, they had everything zeroed in, they had uh, charts of the whole area, they knew down to, the, to a foot just exactly what their orders were required to do. And as a result, we lost an awful lot of people that night. Well, I've thought quite a lot about it. And I've thought a lot about the people uh, who were in the unit that I was in. And they were farmers, fishermen, miners, students, school teachers, police officers, just about every phase of life that you could possibly imagine. And these people trained for the period of five years. They knew and they understood what it was that they were there for. And the loyalty that they had learned early in their lives, after they were born into families, that had deep appreciation for them. They became loyal to the family. They became loyal to the community. And when they joined the armed forces, they became loyal to the armed forces. And as a result, a good many of them died because of their loyalty. But thank God they were there. And as far as the, the purpose served uh, by D-Day, I think that what we did is we kicked the door open, established the beachhead, made it possible for the success of D-Day, and I think it was one of the greatest 
things that ever happened in military history. And all of the people that were there and all of the people that supported it deserve one god awful lot of credit for it. And that includes the civilians that worked in factories and the people who wrote letters, and the people who supplied us with warm socks that we needed from time to time. And generally speaking, the people of Canada can be tremendously proud of the Canadian Armed Forces, and that includes the Navy, who did one terrific job, and the Air Force that never ceased to amaze me, day after day after day, going across the channel and have, coming back with holes in the fuselage of the planes and the wings. Some, in some cases, I've seen the Lancasters coming back with only one engine functioning. And I've seen them bailing out, and only six bailed out, and I've seen the plane go on until it got out of a populated area and landed in water and was still piled up. Say what?